Hello and welcome to the presentation for the paper Q-Plane, an open source reinforcement learning toolkit for autonomous fixed wing aircraft simulation by myself, David Richter, and Professor Ricardo Kelix, who is my advisor. Um, Q-Plane is going to be published in the software track for this year's MMSYS. And um, the first question, of course, is why is Q-Plane necessary? Why do we think Q-Plane um, offers anything new? And what is the new thing that it offers? Well, there actually are toolkits for um, reinforcement learning in, in fixed wing flight already. However, those toolkits have um, one feature, or they, do, they don't have a feature that Qplane now includes that we really thought was um, quite valuable. And that is having multiple flight simulators within this one toolkit. Um, all previous tools that we found in, in our literature review and while looking on GitHub and other places, um, they always focus on having a singular flight simulator implemented, whereas Qplane now has, as of right now, two. And of course, it could be expanded um, because Qplane is not written focused on a singular flight simulator, but it is written um, just to, in a modular fashion where multiple um, flight simulators can be included. And the reason why that is important is because training on a singular flight sim could lead, for example, to a mod model or a the, um, the deep uh, neural network trying to um, kind of, if it finds any flaws within the, in the simulator, for example, it could overfit towards those or it could just generally uh, overfit towards those physics. Having multiple flight simulators lets us actually test that because I can just train my model in one of the flight sims and then test it in the other. If it still works, um, we can already tell that our model is robust to some extent. It is also um, somewhat generalized, uh, it, it generalizes to some extent. Um, another thing that we tried with Qplane is because again, in the literature review, we saw that most of the existing um, flight simulation environments for reinforcement learning were written by computer scientists for computer scientists but a topic like flight simulation, there's gonna be engineers and all, a lot of other people that are also gonna be interested in this topic um, that might have trouble reading code written in that way. So with Qplane, we tried to make it easy to understand. Um, for that, we wrote the code first off in a modular way, but we also made it easy to modify. We made the parameters easy to change. The modules are really easy to, to um, change. You just have to change the include path and it should also be really easy to expand upon to, to create new tasks for the airplane um, to learn. Um, this is a very simple diagram that show, or very simple graph that shows um, the way Qplane is structured. On the left side, we have the environments. That's the two flight simulators that we have. And on the right side are the current, uh, currently implemented algorithms to, to do um, Q-learning. Um, others could easily be implemented just right now. We are uh, focusing on Q learning approaches, not on policy gradient approaches. That's why those are in here. But if someone wanted to have PPO in here, for example, Q plane uh, could definitely be extended to do that. It's just not the main focus of my research right now, uh, which is why it's not included yet. Um, we're going to look at the algorithms first. So reinforcement learning for those who do not really know yet is a, uh, a um, deep learning approach that differs from how um, traditional deep learning works. So we have no pre-existing data set. The agent learns by interacting with the environment. So we have an agent, that's our Q-learning algorithms up here, and they inter interact with the environment, which is the flight simulators. So the agent is gonna um, take an action based of, of, of what it knows, and send, it's gonna send that action to the environment. Based on that action, the environment is gonna change. So for example, if it tells our plane to tilt to the right, we're, um, of course, the plane is going to change position, and therefore the environment changes. The environment is going to then be sent back to the agent with a state, which is just a representation of the environment. So it could be, um, for example, the roll, pitch, and yaw of that current plane. And also a reward, which is just um, a function that we define that um, def that we define how good the, well, uh, pl um, the agent is currently doing in the environment. So if our task is to stabilize the plane at zero pitch and zero roll, then, for example, a reward function could be the um, how far we are deviating from that currently. And then we would calculate an error for that, for example. And then using all these, the old state, the new state after the action, the reward and the action we took, we can put all of them into this Bellman equation. And that is going to update our Q values. And the Q values are state action pairs. So it's going to tell us the expected future discounted reward at state of time t with the action that we took. Um, in regular Q learning, so that was one of the modules, it just works in a lookup table. So we're gonna 
let's say we're in state five right now, we just did action one, then we're gonna update um, this value right here using the before mentioned um, formula that we just looked at, the equation we just saw. And in Q-learning, um, all of this is gonna be saved in a table. So we're just gonna have to run through all the different combinations a numerous amount of times so that it learns. And that's also where the problems come in. Because for one, since it's a table, um, either we have an infinitely large table in terms of actions and or spaces, or we have to make our action and sp state space um, a discrete sp uh, state space, for example. So we're going to have to kind of dumb down our environment. We cannot have roll pitch and yaw angles anymore. We're probably going to have to um, put them in bins, like we would also sometimes, we would also do that in supervised learning, for example. So we're going to have to put them in bins, and we could say, for example, um, if the roll is within negative one and one um, degrees, and if the yaw is within negative one and one degrees, then we're in state one. And then we have four different um, actions, which could just be nose up, nose down, um, flip to the right and flip to the, or tilt to the left. Um, and with that, we can actually achieve a Q-learning approach with Q-plane, even though flight, of course, isn't discrete in any way, but it does work. And we have tested this, and it does indeed work, and I'm going to show that towards the end of this presentation. And also, um, just one more thing, while yes, we have to dumb, dumb down the states, for example, um, we're also losing the, the um, functionality for of general, uh, generalization. That means if the plane in training never really encounters state 11, let's say, because let's just say that's an extreme outlier, then in testing, it is not going to know what to do here. It's It doesn't generalize at all. So even if state 11 is very close to state 10, this Q-learning approach is not going to know that, and state 11 will just be unknown to it, even though it might be almost the same. To get rid of that problem, we can use deep Q-learning approaches. In deep Q-learning approaches, we're using neural networks as function approximators for these Q values. So instead of a table, we now have um, state inputs here. These can be continuous and these can be multi-values. We can have multiple values as a singular state. So it could be roll, pitch, yaw, and speed, for example, which then all together represents the state as opposed to just having a singular value. Um, the hidden layers are up to the designer. We can, we can have them however we want. What's important though is the outputs because this is not a softmax classification problem we are actually using um, linear regression at the, or we're using a regression at the end here with a linear output layer. And we are predicting the Q value. So the um, future expected discounted reward at this state with these different actions. So if we have, for example, three different actions that the agent can choose from, then there's gonna be three outputs and the inputs is not the state space specifically. So it's not, not each state has its own input, but um, each, variable um, defining this, the, the state. So like I said, if it's roll pitch yaw, then it would just say 12 degrees, 14 degrees, 16 degrees, and maybe 60 knots or something like that. And we're trying to predict these Q values. The Q values are exactly the same that would be stored in here. And then we are gonna um, arc max over the Q values and figure out which one would have the best reward, therefore maximize our policy. Um, on the other side of Q plane is where Q plane actually stands out because these are just implemented after their original papers. Um, this is just the Emni et al, and that's the Van Hasselt approach. Here we are actually, um, is where Qplane um, kind of, um, yeah, sticks out and, and, and has something new to offer. And that is multiple flight simulators. So here we see Xplane, which is one of the two currently implemented flight simulators. Xplane is a fully fledged commercially marketed flight simulator that has highly accurate flight dynamics and it is being sold as a game as well as a research tool. Um, but because that is the case, x is kind of closed off. So the, the physics loop and everything is functioning on its own. So if we want to communicate with it, we have to use a plugin. And that plugin is developed by NASA and it's called x Connect. Uh, with this package, we can interact with the physics loop of x um, through UDP packages. And therefore, we can actually interact with the plane. We can reset it. We can send it actions. We can get the states back and all that sort of stuff. On the other hand, we have uh, JSBSIM. JSBSIM is a open source and free to use flight dynamics model. So JSBSIM it, on its own does not do any rendering. Um, NASA has run tests on JSBSIM and they also deemed it to be highly accurate. Um, according to their GitHub account, um, that's what they state there. It can be included just as a library in the, in the source code. 
So in Qplane, you really just have a include JSP sim, um, and then you um, just git clone their repository to have some of the more important files, and it just runs in command line, which is super um, useful, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, we can therefore also directly interface with it, so we don't have to send UDP packages or anything. We can just interact with the variables because it's a library. And if we do want to have 3D rendering, for example, for testing purposes, um, then we can enable that with Flight Gear. Um, Flight Gear is also open source, it's also free to use, and it uses JSB Sims physics um, to, to run. So we can just replace the built in JSB Sim physics that Flight Gear has, and again with UDP, send our um, JSB Sim physics that we're calculating to it, and therefore it just renders what we're running. Um, some of the differences are for one, and that's important for training, and the, the first two I'm going to mention are important for training and testing, and the other two are just important for implementation. So if we look at the bottom two, speed up capabilities. In X-Plane, you can only compute the physics in real time, because X-Plane does not allow us to step the physics, we have no control over the physics loop, or over any of the game loops. So we can only interact with the game the way the game runs, and the game runs in real time. That means if we want to... Um, for example, simulate a minute of flight time, it is going to take a full minute for that flight time to pass. And um, so a second of, sim of, of, of um, physics in X-Plane is actually going to be executed in a second. So um, that, of course, makes training a very long and tedious pro problem, especially if we need long flight times. So if, for example, we have a problem where we want to land, um, that would take very long, right? On the other hand, in JSP Sim, it's a library. We include it, we step the physics, we, we step the loop, um, and therefore we can control how fast it goes. So if our computer is really powerful, then that one minute of flight time might only take five seconds, which obviously increases training by a lot. So that is one of the very big upsides for JSP Sim as, and also why JSP Sim is recommended for training. The second reason why JSP Sim is, rec um, is the recommended training um, environment here is headless mode. X, again, X-Plane is a game, and X-Plane runs as a game, and we only interface with the game through UDP packages. That means if we want to train X-Plane, we have to have X-Plane running. So on a Windows computer, the X-Plane EXE has to be running for us to communicate with it, which, for one, takes away resources. So, for example, the GPU is going to be busy rendering out X-Plane, the CPU is going to be um, busy you know, calculating um, everything in the background, and it's just taking away resources from, from, from what we're doing, even though we don't need the rendering, right? In JSP Sim, we can just turn off the rendering. Again, it's just a library. We don't even have to really turn off the rendering. We just don't start flight gear, and it, it will be fine. Um, another reason why that is important is because if we want to, for example, run our code on a GPU box that is only command line interface ready, or if we run it on a supercomputer, for example, where we have scheduling, then we would have to make sure that while, while our program is in queue, that X-Plane is up and running and it's already within flight um, because we have to leave the main menu and actually go within, uh, into a flight scenario for X-Plane to work. And that's, of course, a lot more difficult than just having a, you know, your code package. You schedule it in the supercomputer and when it's ready, it just starts the code, which is just how it works in JSP Sim. Um, if we look at some other differences, that's why it's a bit tricky to, um, to uh, actually have both running at the, or have both be compatible. Um, a lot of the orientation is different because these two programs are uh, developed completely independent of each other. So, for example, north and south are just the opposite. In, in JSP Sim, north is positive, south is negative. In Xplain, for, for example, it's the complete opposite. And there's many examples like that. And also the units that are used are different. So, for example, Metric is being used in X-Plane, Imperial is used in JSP Sim, and again, there's many different examples and like for that, and of course that's important because the states need to be the same for the for um if I for if I want to have a model trained in one and then used in the other. So for them to be compatible, they have to be the same, and that's what Qplane did. We have converted for the, the task that we have currently, we have converted all of these to be identical. Um, the example I'm going to show is going to be added to control. This is where we're going to try to control the pitch and roll axis. And for that, use the ailerons and the elevators. And down here um, is the different representation. So in deep, in deep, we have pitch roll, angle of velocities, angle of attack, and angle of slip. Um, for non-deep, we, we bin pitch and roll and encode them uniquely. And the actions are 
um, ailerons and elevators. And here's a proof of concept. So we can see that the graph actually does converge to a policy. And we can take a look at that policy right now. I'm just going to open up a video. So first, we're going to look at um, a video where we see a plane that is not trained. So this is just random inputs. And we're going to take a quick look at them. And we can see that this plane does not catch itself ever. It just keeps drifting more and more to the left. Of course, we don't like that. So if we take a look at the model in JSPSIM, so this model was also trained in JSPSIM, we can see that the plane spawns and it catches itself instantly and it will remain in that. It's never going to drift off like an untrained agent would. It's going to remain in perfectly level flight. Um, if we look at the same in X-plane, we can also see that X-plane, it spawns, it catches itself, and it does perfectly fine after. And the interesting thing here is that this agent that we're currently seeing here has never seen X-Plane before. It has been trained completely in JSP sim, but through all the conversions, um, adjusting the um, orientation, the units, and making sure that both modules work identical, we can train a model in JSP sim and use an X-Plane to prove that there is some robustness to it. Um, now, what does future work? Well, we could um, add a few features like random initial position, random desired positions. The modular architecture could maybe ma uh, be made better for scenarios, for example. We could try to speed up the process even more. The training doesn't last as long just to try to get better performance. Um, we could add PPO, for example, which is one of the um, algorithms used a lot in, 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 in literature. And we could just add additional scenarios. The reason why that has not yet been done is because the current research we're doing with Qplane we want to look into Q-learning with attitude control. If you have any questions, you can let me know on my GitHub. Thank you.